Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. If there's anything that we want to remember when we're done today is that God sees the heart. And he's not impressed with all of our shenanigans, our outfits, the way we look, our hairstyle, the people we hang out with, the label in our clothes, the car we drive, the house we live in, the neighborhood we live in, our string of degrees behind our name. The only thing that impresses God is do you have a good heart? Do you love God? How many of you feel that you need more confidence in your life? Okay, well, can I tell you something that's really not true? You say it's not? Well, if you lifted up your hand and said you need more confidence, but you're a born again Christian, then you already have everything you need living inside of you to do everything that you could ever want to do. The world tells us that we need more self-confidence, but God tells us the most dangerous thing that we can do is to be confident in ourselves. <laughs> that we are to be confident in him. So yes, we want confidence, and we want confidence that we can do what we need to do, but we don't want to refer to it as self-confidence because the only confidence that we have is based on who we are in Christ. Now, you know, I studied this morning, and studying gave me a certain amount of confidence that I could come up here and deliver this message properly. I've done this thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and so that experience certainly gives me a certain amount of confidence that I can come up here and do this right. But there's something else way down deep inside of me And I can tell you that I know, 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 that neither my study alone, nor my experience, nor anything else will make this session today a success if Jesus is not all over it, in it, through it, under it, around it. There's a scripture that's just coming to my heart right now. The Bible tells us that God will not share his glory with anyone. So all the glory goes to God for any success that we ever have. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we Christians are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and by the spirit of God. And we exalt and glory and pride ourselves in Jesus Christ. And we put no confidence, our dependence, let's read it again. We put no confidence, our dependence, on what we are in the flesh and on outward privileges and physical advantages and external appearances. So that means that our confidence should not come from what we look like, although we all want to look our best, you know. I, I worked hard on this this morning. You know, I didn't, I can promise you, I didn't look like this when I got up. And, and, and I worked on it, and I got the matchy thing going on, and you know, yes, I want to look nice, and it, it makes you feel good if you feel that you look your best, but we can't be all so caught up in the way we look that if we have one pimple one day or happen to have a bad hair day that we're going berserk now and feeling like, you know, we're just no good and now we feel bad all day and we're grouchy all day. We have to have our confidence in Christ. You can't have your confidence in your money, your job title. You know, if you're a doctor, that's great. But if you work in a factory, that's great too. And the factory worker can have just as much confidence as the doctor, and you know, just because the world looks at different people different and admires certain things over others, that doesn't mean that God sees things that way. If there's anything that we want to 
remember when we're done today is that God sees the heart. And he's not impressed with all of our shenanigans, our outfits, the way we look, our hairstyle, the people we hang out with, the label in our clothes, the car we drive, the house we live in, the neighborhood we live in, our string of degrees behind our name. The only thing that impresses God is, do you have a good heart? Do you love God? Do you love people? Do you want to be obedient? Are you looking forward to him coming back to get you? Yes. Amen. Confidence is a belief that you can do a thing. And I believe that I could come out here and do this this morning, and I already believe I can do it tonight, and I'm already believing that I can do it until I'm, I don't know, 95 or 100. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I know that I cannot do it without God. Every day, you ought to say at least about five or six times, God, apart from you, I can do nothing. And in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Nothing. But I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. Confidence is a belief that you can do a thing. It's faith. When you're confident, you can relax and not worry or be afraid. I'm really pretty relaxed when I'm up here. Why? Because I'm not really trying to impress anybody. You know, after people clap for you long enough, you get over that. And so it's like, there's a freedom in no longer needing to impress people. If you like me, God's going to have to make you like me. I don't have to get up here and try to play all these games. And, you know, so I have fun doing this. Until I learned this, it was killing me. I mean, the pressure was killing me. Because when you get up in front of people or you go to work every day or, and all you can think about is how you look and what people think and what they're saying about you. And, you know, if you're in with the right group, I mean, it's, it's a lot of pressure. How many of you know that that pressure is a lot of pressure? So we want to have confidence. I heard one time that a believer with no confidence is like a jumbo jet sitting on the runway with no fuel in it. You got all the equipment, but no fuel to go anywhere. Now, the Bible talks about wise men and it talks about fools. And so we're going to take a look at what the Word of God actually says a fool is. Proverbs chapter 26. I've got down here the first 12 verses. I'll see if I can keep your attention that long. <laughs> Proverbs 26, beginning in verse 1. Like snow in summer and like rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a self-confident fool. Now, I, I'm, I really love the Amplified Bible for a lot of different reasons. It's just the one that I've always used. And of course, there's lots of great translations of the Bible. But if I didn't have this Amplified Bible, that wouldn't say self-confident. It would just say for a fool. And I could go all my life not really understanding that in God's economy, a fool is somebody who depends on themselves. <laughs> like the sparrow in her wanderings and like the swallow in her flying so the curseless cause does not come a whip for the horse a bridle for the donkey and a straight slender rod for the back of a self-confident fool in other words a fool is always going to be taking some kind of a beating <laughs> it might be a financial beating All these things just never turn out right for him. God's not going to let things turn out right for you if you're not depending on him. You say, well, wait a minute. I know all kinds of wealthy people that have got all kinds of stuff, and they're not even believers. Well, go find out if they're really happy. Find out how many fears they have in their life about losing what they have. Find out how many people really love them or if anybody even likes them. Because usually when you're working on the world system, to get a lot, this doesn't always happen, but a lot of people, they got to walk all over somebody else to get it, mistreat other people. And the good news is, is when you have your confidence in God and you obey him, he can lift you up and promote you without you playing all those games. 
A fool is always taking a mental beating. The self-confident man must worry, be anxious, reason, be in fear. A self-confident fool also takes an emotional beating. Nothing really works out right for him. And since he's worked so hard in his life to make everything work out, he only has one option, and that is to be upset when things don't work out. And see, the good thing for those of us that are believers in Christ, once we really learn how to operate in the kingdom economy, and there are ways that God operates that the world doesn't understand, I can do the very best that I can. I can plan and have a program and do my best to work it. And you know what? If for some reason it doesn't work, then I can just say, well, I guess I missed God or my timing was off or whatever, but praise God, he still loves me. And I can just let go of what lies behind and press on to the next good thing that God has for me. I don't have to just have three years of depression because I tried something and it didn't work out. So say with me, a fool is always taking a beating. <laughs> Answer not a self-confident fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. You know, if you want to know where somebody's confidence is, all you have to do is just listen to them for a little bit because somebody who's self-confident cannot keep their mouth shut about themselves. They can't say a sentence without I, me, and mine in it. Answer a self-confident fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes and conceit. So he's saying there is a time to come back at a fool and try to straighten them out. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off the feet of satisfactory delivery. <laughs> in other words, the worst thing that I could do would be to have a bunch of fools working for me. Because no matter what I send them to do, it's not going to work out. I would much rather have somebody that is less naturally talented, but really leans on God working for me than somebody who's super smart and full of themselves. Amen? Come on, somebody give God praise. So I think you get the point. I don't think I need to read the rest of that, but you can read it yourself. You'll find that many places in Proverbs, a fool is a self-confident man. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, when people give you compliments, you should receive them. Be gracious. That doesn't mean that you're proud and haughty. I love what uh, Corey Ten Boom, she said, I get compliments all the time, and everyone that comes to me, I receive it as a rose, and at the end of the day, I take the bouquet and give it all back to Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, you know, if, if you, even if God helps you do a good job, you're going to get some attention. People are going to tell you they appreciate you. They're going to tell you that, you know, and, and that's fine. Receive that. Receive it graciously. Unless somebody gets into worship, then you need to straighten them out. And, but then just always make sure that you give it all back to God. All back to God. You know, sometimes even when I do things or, you know, when I go and I do speaking engagements, I always get introduced. You know, here I don't bother with that. I just come out. But when I go places and I get introduced, I mean, sometimes the way they make me sound, you would think that I was the greatest thing next to sliced bread. And, you know, while they're saying it, I kind of just talk to God and just say, well, you and I both know I'm nothing without you. So it's kind of funny how important they think I am, but we both know that I'm not. And so see, it's really your heart toward God that makes a difference. And so it's great if you're helping people and they want to encourage you. And I mean, that's good. We all need to be encouraged, but it's what you do with it after that. I remember before my ministry got very sizable at all. One night I was sitting on the edge of my bed, on the side of my bed, and I was getting ready to go to sleep. And I mean, for about 45 minutes, the Lord started dealing with me. And it kind of went like this. We weren't having like some open conversation, but you know, when God puts things on your heart, you know what he's saying. And so by the time God got finished, I, I sensed in my heart that God was getting ready to do some really good things as far as letting us be able to help more people in our ministry growing. And the long and the short of it was the message from him was, there's something I want you to always remember. Whatever good thing that you see happen through you, it is not you. 
It is me working through you. Wait a minute, I'm not done. <laughs> and it only means that I have wrestled with you long enough <laughs> to get just another little square inch of your flesh that I can work through without you taking the credit. Amen? Amen. Come on now. So God wants to use us. But let me tell you something, anybody listening to me, anybody in this place, if you want to be used by God, if you, if you want to own your own company, let's just say you're the boss. You know what? The, the worst thing in the world that you can do is act like a boss. Anybody can be a boss, but not everybody can be a leader. It doesn't take any talent to boss people around. And as soon as you start thinking that you're something, then that's what happens. You start looking down on others that you don't think are the something you are. It happens to all of us. All of us. If you're going to sit there and tell me that you're never tempted with pride, then I'm going to have to tell you that you are lying. Because pride is at the base of all sin. When Lucifer fell from the exalted place that God had given him, it was pride that caused it. Five times in two verses or one verse, he said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And God said, let me show you what's going to happen. <laughs> That's all of you. Only God. Apart from me, you can do nothing, the Bible says. Let's look at John 15, 5. And you might be thinking, well, I came here hurting today, and I need to be comforted. I feel like you're kind of beating up on me. <laughs> well, you know what, Will? We'll pray for somebody to hug you and love on you before you get out of here, but. <laughs> the point is, is if you ever want God to do anything great for you, <laughs> then you gotta be prepared for it spiritually. And that means that you gotta still know that apart from him, you can do nothing. John 15, five. I am the vine, you're the branch. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. Now, this tree was outside my room, and yes, I attacked it. <laughs> Here's the thing. All right, now, this flower is only on here because this was attached to a vine that was giving it life from within. So Christ comes to live in us, and he gives us life from deep within us, and we, we really don't comprehend how dependent this little branch is on that vine. See, all it does really is just kind of hang there, and everything else comes to it. Well, see, we need to learn how to just be sure that we're hanging on the vine. God, I'm nothing without you. Now, there's a bunch of little buds on here that you know what, are never gonna bloom. You know why? Because now it's off the vine. So I wonder how many possibilities, okay, maybe you've had, a, maybe you've had one flowering success. <laughs> and so now that success has gotten you off the vine because now you're so busy taking care of your success Amen. That now you have no time for the hanging vine thing anymore. <laughs> oh, man, I remember years where I just walked around, God, you got to help me. God, help me. I mean, I started to feel like I was like some kind of a mental case. I mean, I was just like, I didn't even know what I needed help with, but I just felt so overwhelmed. I mean, the vision I had was completely stupid. Why would I think that this could ever happen to me? Why would I think that God wanted to use me, a, a totally unqualified, uneducated woman with half a brain from Fenton, Missouri? Who, who did I think I was? Oh, yeah, you're going to, I just go, oh, God, you got to help me, God, help me, help me, help me. Well, I was hanging on the vine. Let me tell you, I was hanging on the vine. 
I mean, I was believing God for anybody. I didn't care if there were two people to call me and ask me to come and speak. Just anybody. Well, then I started getting a little success. Well, then if I would get too far off that vine, man, everything would start to shut down. And then I'd have to, I'm sorry, Lord. You gotta always keep him first. He's not happy with second place. He's only gonna have first place. Amen. You keep God in his place and you stay in your place and everything's always gonna work out good. So I had this one little flower, but I had all these other little possibilities. Man, there's a whole bunch of them things on there. Wow, that thing would end up really pretty if we wouldn't have taken it off the vine. I think that this word today is timely for some people. Now, this is good for everybody here, trust me. But there's some people here today and some people watching by TV and listening even by recorded device that this is a word from God for you. You got a little flower. You, you got a little fruit. Well... Don't get your eyes so much on that that now you just get all full of yourself and start going around giving success lessons to everybody. <laughs> Come on. Don't you just love those people that when you say to them, you tell them what you're struggling with and they say, oh yeah, I, I, I was having a problem with that, but I just did this and that and it, it, that's all you need to do. I just want to go. <laughs> I tell you what, every victory I got, I had to walk it out and suffer. Yeah, I started smoking when I was nine years old, and it was the hardest thing in the world for me to quit smoking. Whew. Matter of fact, when I started teaching, <laughs> when I started teaching my first Bible study, I would sit on the floor with short shorts on and blow smoke in everybody's face. <laughs> That's how I started. And you think God doesn't love you the way you are and he won't accept you the way you are? You know what? God sees the heart. And God sees the end from the beginning. Now, if I was still dressed like that and still blowing smoke in everybody's face, chances are I probably wouldn't be here today. So there is a little pruning that needs to go on in our lives. Amen. And today is a surgery day. We had the worship to anesthetize us. That's the way I look at worship. It's just like, oh, Jesus, I love you so much. Says, Whatever, God, your will be done. And then I come in with the knife. Now, you know, this thing already doesn't look as good as it did this morning. And we're going to look at this every session. It wouldn't surprise me if by tomorrow it's totally dead. You gotta hang on the vine. You gotta stay with Jesus. And you know what? You not only seek him in the valley, but you seek him on the mountaintop. Amen? Well, I often say that self-confidence is the belief that you can do a thing. But we also have to realize that God's Word says, apart from Him, we can do nothing, but that we can do all things through Him. So yes, we can do it, but we can only do it through Him and through continually receiving His strength. So we really don't need more self-confidence. What we really need is more God confidence. así a escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba cómo a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener 
la familia como en secreto esas cosas. Que no, que era fea, que no, que nadie me pescaba. Que no había esperanza en mí. Que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme. Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step by step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they are reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Jimena, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, del abrazo familiar, del abrazo de alguien que te ama, lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumento de Dios. Y esta es mi familia. Ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que Él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. What do you see now? When I'm working, many people come to me and say, oh, your smile, you have something special. A ver que it's special. And one day I stopped and looked at the mirror, but I looked at my eyes. And he said, I did this. And it was my face. What an amazing privilege to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman, it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty and you can do that with us right here in Chile as we've been talking about and in many, many places all over the world. Do you think that your thoughts are random and meaningless? Or do they affect you more than you realize? Well, God's Word teaches us the importance of our thoughts. In Strijd in je Denken legt Joyce uit waarom letterlijk alles in ons leven samenhangt met ons denken. Actually, everything in life begins with a thought, even the changes that you might be looking for. Deze bestseller, met een oplage van ruim 6 miljoen exemplaren, heeft het leven van veel mensen al veranderd. Bestel Strijd in je Denken door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joy-meyer.nl slash strijd.